So as we talk about chapter three, section three, uh, we're gonna talk about some of these first international traders. We're gonna be talking about the development of civilizations beyond the Fertile Crescent at this point. So we're gonna move outside of the Middle East and begin looking at Greece and begin looking at uh, even further into the Indus River Valley or into the Huanghe River Valley in China uh, as we go through the course. Uh, but let's start with the Greek. The earliest Greek peoples were a group called the Minoans. They lived on an island called Crete in the Aegean Sea. And so if you look at a map, and I'll zoom in and show you the map in just a moment, uh, Greece looks like a hand turned upside down. That's basically the shape of the country. And it's surrounded by the Mediterranean Sea on three sides. Uh, Greece is also an archipelago, meaning that it has tons of these tiny little islands. Crete is just one of them. Uh, there's the island of Scalapagos, there's the island of um, Milos, there's the island, of course, of Crete. Uh, and all of these are around the Aegean Sea. And it was the Minoans who first dominated trade in the Mediterranean. Um, and also, just for reference, the Mediterranean Sea is what borders southern Europe and North Africa and then the Middle East. And so it's called the Mediterranean, which is a Greek word for Middle Earth. So if you're a Tolkien fan, Middle Earth is also known as the Mediterranean in Greek. Well, the Minoans had a great deal of influence on the ancient world. And one of the best pieces of evidence for this is we find Minoan artifacts in Palestine, in North Africa, in the Iberian Peninsula, also known as Spain. And we find these artifacts from the Minoans all over the place. And when we were talking about symbols that are important to a culture, you know, you might think of the eagle as important to American culture, or even in Mexico, the eagle is, is their national bird. And so you see these symbols uh, that come to represent a culture or even a country. Well, for the Minoans, it was the bull. And I'm sure you've heard the famous story of the Minotaur. The Minotaur was an ancient bull, half bull, half man, that was trapped in a large maze called the labyrinth. And the way the legend went, the Minotaur was actually the son of the king who was the king of Minos and of course the Minotaur is named after the people of Minos uh, and then the king created this labyrinth that anyone trying to break into the castle would have to go through and the Minotaur would kill them um, and so that ancient story dates all the way back to the Minoan people one of the countries one of the countries that traded so let's zoom with in a little was the island of Crete lying just north of Egypt in the Mediterranean Sea. Crete was the land of the Minoans, the fabled people who were visited by Theseus, the Greek hero. He was helped by the Cretan princess Ariadne to kill the bull-headed Minotaur. Crete, blessed with adequate rain and lots of sunshine, was able to grow grapes, olives, and vegetables. Pastures supported goats and cattle. They hunted deer and boar for food. Like Egypt, Crete had an agricultural economy and could produce a surplus for export. Painted Minoan pottery has been found in Syria and Cyprus, as well as Egypt. Unlike Egypt, Crete was a relatively peaceful seafaring nation and apparently so confident in its sea power and large armed merchant fleet that its towns weren't fortified. Isn't it fact that in all Cretan art, no scene of war has yet been found? True. Palaces resembled storehouses more than fortresses. We can still see the huge pithy, or jars, used for storing wine and grain. There were palace settlements all over Crete. The most famous is Knossos. 
The palace followed a pattern similar to that of the temple complex in Sumer. Along with the houses of the nobles, it contained the administrative center, craftsmen's workshops, and religious shrines. It was built of stone supported by wooden beams and often covered by lime plaster. Called the Labrys, or House of the Double Axe, it also became known to the Greeks as the Labyrinth, after its intricate maze of corridors. Labyrinth is in our dictionaries today, meaning a maze or something involved and complex. This room, with its 3,000-year-old stone throne, still intact, is considered the oldest throne room in Europe. Scholars speculate that a queen or chief priestess sat on the throne. Perhaps Ariadne. The Minoans were expert engineers, too. Along with light wells that warmed or cooled the buildings depending on the season, they developed a sophisticated system of drains, as well as bathrooms with toilets that could be flushed with water. Minoan architects built houses with inner courtyards and light wells, a concept Europeans didn't utilize until 3,000 years later. As well as being good engineers, the Minoans created exquisite works of art. They painted the walls of their rooms and decorated their vases and furnishings with flowers, fish, animals, and trees. The people of the neighboring island of Thera had a distinct culture of their own, but were influenced by the Minoans, as you can see from their frescoes. All we know about the Minoan way of life is based on some elegant wall paintings, the artifacts, and architecture. Very little hard fact is known about them, as no one has yet deciphered their writing, called by scholars Linear A. The most famous example of Minoan writing is the Festus Disc, found in the Palace of Festus, still waiting to be translated. Looking at these paintings, you can see why both archaeologists and visitors to Knossos have been seduced by the slim, beautiful people in the murals. Men wore a kilt or loincloth. It was made of local wool or linen, possibly imported from Egypt. The outfit was completed by a tight girdle-like belt that exaggerated their slimness. The women wore a loose-fitting robe with a deep neck that exposed the breasts. Over this was fitted a gaily colored flounced skirt held in place by a tight corset-like belt. Both men and women wore jewelry. According to some, Cretans saw the supreme being as a woman. She was associated with the horns of a bull and the double axe. She was the protector of crops, life and death forces, and could influence good and evil. Her snakes symbolize the underworld, or possibly the earth from which life springs. From frescoes and murals of women taking part in social life openly, comfortably feasting and gossiping at public gatherings, and the absence of a dominant king figure, scholars conclude that women played major roles in the society. A matriarchy? Perhaps. The double axe, whose meaning we have already noted, was often connected with the bull and its worship. This veneration of the bull produced the most fascinating aspect of the Minoan culture, the spectacular bull-leaping ceremony. A youth, agile and graceful, somersaults over the bull's back after using the horns as leverage. A female assistant will catch him, while another girl with hands on the horns seemingly prepares to leap.
From what we can see, their preoccupations did not include elaborate afterlife rituals. The body was simply folded into this sarcophagus and buried. Do you think they might have used it as a bathtub first? They seem a practical people, so why not? Unfortunately, the wealthy Minoan economy was coveted by others, and they were invaded by the more aggressive Mycenaeans from mainland Greece. From this great lion's gate at the fortress Acropolis of Mycenae may have come Mycenaeans to overwhelm the more peaceful Minoans. For some years, their cultures mixed. Agamemnon, the Mycenaean general who fought in the Trojan War, even had Cretans in his army. What happened to the Minoans finally? We'll have to wait till the last program for that. We're going to look at the map here. This is a very, very zoomed in version of Greece. So here's the Aegean Sea. Uh, that divides Greece and Anatolia. Anatolia is known as modern-day Turkey, uh, but it's also the site of the ancient city of Troy. And then here, to the south of Greece, is the island of Crete. So what do we know about the Minoans? Well, first we know they were a brilliant civilization. When we dug up their capital city, which is called Gnosis, uh, we found a number of drawings, like the one you see here. This drawing dates back to the ancient Minoans. Everywhere in their ancient cities, we find these drawings of beautiful, athletic people. We also find lots of drawings of nature and many other beautiful things. We see many drawings of women, uh, many of their uh, religious rituals, uh, detailed uh, men and women playing an equal role. But we've also found evidence of sacrifice, the sacrifice of animals, and in some cases, even people. And we've dug this up. We've found the remains. Okay, this person buried in this religious ritual site uh, was probably sacrificed to these particular pantheon of gods. And so it's the job of archaeologists to try to learn as much as we can about ancient civilizations. Um, in fact, this civilization was called Manoah after the story of King Minos. Again, he's the one who had the son with the Minotaur. Now, the Minoan people came to a mysterious end. So we found, again, evidence of their civilization, the, the city of Gnosis. You can dig it up. You can look at it. You can go visit it today. And it's, and it's beautiful. But they're all in ruins. And, you know, as we begin to date these things, okay, how old is this using carbon dating? You know, uh, when were these structures put together? When did they come to ruin? Uh, and, and we can fairly accurately pinpoint that their cities were in ruins by 1700 BCE. But we also found evidence that they've rebuilt on top of these cities. So today, if you go to the city of Baghdad in Iraq, it's one of the oldest cities in the world. And so the city of Baghdad has been built on top of the ruins of many previous civilizations, dating all the way back to the Mesopotamians and the great city of Babylon. The city of Rome as well. It was destroyed and rebuilt seven times just throughout the history of the Western Roman Empire, which fell in 476. But again, it was destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. And so, you know, the evidence points to an earthquake that caused severe damage, but again, they rebuilt. But then in 1470 BCE, there were earthquakes as well as volcanoes. You know, crazy natural disasters, perhaps typhoons, hurricanes, for whatever reason, in 470 BCE, the city was destroyed with finality. It was never rebuilt. And after 470 BCE, different groups of people 
came into the island of Crete. Uh, of Crete, excuse me. Different groups of people speaking Greek. Now, the next group of people I want to talk about are some of the most significant in the ancient world, the Phoenicians. And the reason I say they're some of the most significant is because you find artifacts of theirs all over the Mediterranean world, all around the coast of North Africa and to the coast of Palestine, the coast of Southern Europe. These people went everywhere. Uh, so here's a few things we know about them. They were skilled shipbuilders. They were all over the Mediterranean. Uh, they typically stuck to the coast because they don't have the sextant, they don't have the astrolabe or the compass yet. If they're going to go overseas, they better stay within sight of land. Or they're going to get lost and go who knows where. They might wind up like Odysseus, wandering the seas for 20 years, trying to find their home. And it wasn't uncommon for ships to get blown off course, to lose sight of land, and to never return. And so the sea was a place of mystery and superstition that people feared. But the Phoenicians, meanwhile, were masters of the sea. And they had set up outposts all across the Mediterranean and set up colonies and had, had settled on many of these islands. Now, the Phoenicians, and like I told you, were noted for, for many different achievements. But they were also some of the only people who knew how to produce the color purple. They would send divers who had to hold their breath and dive down to the bottom of the sea. And taking a knife, they would cut these shells from the bottom of the ocean bed. And they would bring these shells up at great personal risk. I mean, they would have to hold their breath and hold it for several minutes even. And they would train themselves to do this. And they would bring these shells up. And they would grind up the shells and they would use it in their dye to create the color purple. And it was so expensive that only kings could afford to wear this color, which became associated with royalty. Here's a drawing of a Phoenician ship arriving in Alexandria in Egypt. Of course, it's a painting, it's an artist's rendering, but it gives you some examples of what we know and what we don't about the Phoenicians. For example, they have a prow, which can be used to turn uh, and steer. They have sails. Uh, which can be used to propel their boats. This is the shell. This is a particular type of mollusk that when ground up, the color purple can be made from. Today you can create it artificially through a chemical process. It's not that valuable anymore. But once upon a time, you had to find this shell. Often imitated, never duplicated, you had to find this shell to get the color purple.
Now let's look at the next great traders of the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians. The economy of the Mediterranean world depended on trade, and the Phoenicians carried goods to and fro, as well as establishing their own colonies. Their settlements spread all over the Mediterranean. Carthage in North Africa eventually became the most powerful of the Phoenician city-states. Each colony retained its political independence. Fierce warships accompanied their galleys, and they traded glass, worked metal, pottery, purple-dyed woolen cloth, animal skins, and slaves. At the height of their commercial power, although the Phoenicians were a maritime trading nation, they accompanied caravans going overland to points as far away as Ethiopia in East Africa and Nigeria in West Africa. The Phoenicians' greatest legacy to the Western world was the transmission of the alphabet, which they brought from the East and which we still use today. Here's how the first four letters developed: from the Egyptian pictograph to cuneiform, to early Phoenician. To late Phoenician, to old Greek, to modern Greek, to Latin and English. Their cemeteries can easily be recognized by the tanit emblem of their great goddess, which was to be found all over the Mediterranean. We have seen how the Egyptians, with their rich natural food source, developed an agriculturally based economy. And similarly, the Minoans, from their abundant island, expanded their economy by trade. And how trade was the base of the economy of the Phoenicians. And so next, as we think about what are some of their legacies, you know, trade. It's probably their most important legacy. But the next is the alphabet. The alphabet. The very word alphabet is really just the first two Greek letters. Alpha and beta. It's very similar to the alphabet that we still use today. And I'll kind of show you the evolution of the, the lettering and the language. Uh, because it's from this ancient language that the very words you're writing right now are coming from these peoples. So talk about a legacy. We're still using what they developed right now. So this little chart shows the evolution of the letters. And I'm just going to use the first one for example. So the letter A, fun fact, was once used to indicate how many cows a farmer owned. So if you're walking through a field and you happen to see a herd of cows, they might have one of these letters branded onto them. Well, the origin of the letter A was just that it looked like a cow. If you turn the letter A upside down, it looks like uh, two horns, looks like a head, you could even put a smiley face in there. It looks like a cow. And if you go to a uh, fence post or ancient markers in the ancient world, you would see numbers of these symbols indicating how many of these cows belong to this individual person. So that's just the letter A. The rest I won't get into. But you can see that over time, the actual symbol from the Phoenicians to the Greek to the modern English has changed very little. Trade is one of the most important links to civilizations. It is the reason why you have cultural blending in the ancient world. You know, what reason might you care to go to Egypt? Why would you even bother? You might get lost at sea. Very likely you'll get lost at sea. What makes the risk worth it? Well, if there's something that they have that your people don't, and you can successfully get to Egypt and back with that thing, you, you can make lots of money. Yes, profit. What motivated Christopher Columbus to brave the Atlantic Ocean? The chance to make lots of money. 
if he had hit India and loaded his boats with spices and come back, he would have discovered a direct route to India. It would have bypassed all the middlemen that made the banking class rise in India. It would have made him tons and tons and tons of money. And so he braved the risk. Lots of his people died. They took those risks on the hope of making lots of money. So, so trade is, is why we bother traveling the world in many cases. And so these traders with them bring their culture, their new ideas, their religion. This map shows patterns of ancient trade dating all the way back to 2000 BCE. And you'll see that for the most part, boats did not leave the site of the coast. But this gives them lots of opportunities. You know, you'll find, uh, you know, say we're talking about the Roman peoples, and we'll be getting to them soon in chapter 6. You'll find evidence of Roman culture and civilization all throughout the ancient world. Again, still just traveling the coast.